Chapter 1 Farewell to Humanity's Childhood Or, Why This Is Not a Book About the Origins of Inequality This mood makes itself felt everywhere, politically, socially, and philosophically. We are living in what the Greeks called the Kairos, the right time for a metamorphosis of the gods of the fundamental principles and symbols. Xi Jinping then discovered self, 1958. Most of human history is, is reparably lost to us. Our, spe our species Homo sapiens has existed for at least 200 years, 200,000 years. But for most of what time? who have next to no idea what was happening. In northern Spain, for instance, at the cave of Altamira, paintings and engravings were created over a period of at least 10,000 10, years, between around 25,000 and 15,000 BC. Presumably, a lot of dramatic events occurred during this period. We have no way of knowing what most of them, of them were. This is of little consequence to most people, since most people rarely think about the broad set of the broad sweep of human history anyway. They don't have much reason to. In so far, the question comes up at, what, at all. It's usually when reflecting on why the world seems to be in such a mess and why human and why human beings so often treat each other badly. The reason for war, greed, exploitation, systematic indifference to others' suffering, where we always like that or did something at some point go terribly wrong. It is basically a theological debate. Essentially, the question is, are humans innately good or innately evil? If you think about it, the question framed in this in these terms makes very little sense. Good and evil are purely human concept. It would never occur to anyone else to argue whether the whether the whether a fish or a tree were good or evil, because good and evil are concepts humans made are concepts human made humans made up in order to compare ourselves with an, with one another. It follows that arguing about whether humans are fundamentally good or evil makes about as much sense as arguing what arguing about whether humans are fundamentally fat or thin. Nonetheless, on those occasions, when people do reflect on the lessons of prehistory, they almost invariably come back to questions of this kind. We are, we are all familiar with the Christian answer. People once lived in a state of innocence, yet were tainted by original sin. We decide to be good like and have been punished for it. Now we, now we live in a fallen state while hoping for future redemption. Today, the popular version of this story is typically some added variation of Jen Jack Rousseau's discourse on the origin and the foundation of inequality among mankind, which he wrote in 1758, 1754. Once upon a time, the story goes, we were hunter-gatherers, living in a prolonged state of childlike innocence in tiny bands. These bands were egalitarian, they could be for the very reason that, that they were so small. It was only after the agricultural revolution and then still more the rise of cities that this happy condition came to an end, ushering in civilization and the state, which also meant the appearance of writing literature, science, science and philosophy. But at the same time, almost everything bad in human life, patriarchy, standing armies, mass executions, and annoying bureaucrats demanding that we spend much of our lives filling in forms. Of course, 
this a very good simplification but it really does seem to be the foundational story that rises to the surface whenever anyone from an industrial psychologist to revolutionary theorists say something like but of course human beings spend most of the, rev the most of their evolutionary history living in groups of 10 or 20 people or agriculture where perhaps humanity's was mistake and as we'll see many popular writers make the argument make, make the argument quite explicitly the problem is that anyone seeking an alternative to this rather depressing view of history will quickly find that the only one on offer is actually even worse if not Rousseau than Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes Leviathan, published in, in 1651, is in many ways the founding text of modern political theory. It held that humans being the service creators they are live like live in any original state of nature was in no sense innocent it must instead have been solitary poor nasty brutish and sought basically a state of war with everybody fighting against everybody else in so far as there has been any progress from the the benignant state of affairs a hobbyism would agree it has been largely due to exactly those repressive mechanisms that Rousseau was complaining about governments, courts, bureaucracies, police. This view of things has been around for a very long time as well. There's a reason why, there's a reason why in English, the word politics, polite, and police all sound the same. They are all derived from the Greek word police or city the Latin equivalent of which is civitas, which also gives us civility, civic, and a certain modern understanding of civilization. Human society in this view is founded on the collective repression of our basic instincts, which becomes all the more necessary when humans are living in large numbers in the same place. The modern the Hobbesian then would argue that, yes, we did live most of our evolutionary history in tiny bands who could get along mainly, be mainly because they, they shared a common interest in the survival of their offspring, parental investment as evolutionary biologists call it, but even this were in no sense founded in equality. There was always in this version some alpha male leader. Hierarchy and dominion and cynical self-interest have always been the basis of human society it's just that collectively we have learned it we have learned it's to our advantage to prioritize our long-term interests over our short-term instincts or better to create laws that force us to confine our worst impulses to social useful areas like the economy while for bad while for willing them everyone else as the reader can probably detect from our tone, we don't much like the choice between these two alternatives. One objection, our, obje our objections can be classified into three broad categories. As accounts of the general course of human history, they simply aren't true, have die political impl implications, make the past, need the, make the past need needlessly dull. This book is, a, is an attempt to begin to tell another more hopeful and more interesting story, one which at the same time takes better account of what the last few decades of research have taught us. Partly, this is a matter of bringing together evidence that has accumulated in archaeology, anthropology, and kindred disciplines evidence that points towards towards a completely new account of human societies developed over roughly the last 30,000 30, 30, years. Almost, almost, of, almost all of this research goes against the familiar narrative 
but too often the most remarkable discoveries remain confined to the work of specialists or have to be teased or have to be teased out by reading between the lines of scientific publications. To give just a sense of how different the emerging picture is, it is clear now that human societies before the advent of farming were not confined to small egalitarian bands. On the contrary, the world of human gatherers, gatherer, uh, gatherers as it existed before the coming of agriculture was one of both social experiments resembling a carnival para parade of political forms far more than it does the drab abst abstractions of evolutionary theory. Agriculture in turn did not mean the inception of private property, nor did it mark an irreversible step towards inequality. In fact, many of the first farming communities were relatively free of ranks and hierarchies, and far from setting class differences in stone. A surprising number of the world's earliest early cities were organized on robustly egalitarian lines with no need for authoritarian rulers, ambitious warrior politicians, or even bossy administrators. Information, be, information bearing on such issues has been pouring in, in, from, in from every quarter of the, globe, of the globe. As a result, researchers around the around the world have also been examining ethnographic and historical material, material in a new light. The pieces now exist to create an entirely different world history. But so far, they remain hidden to all but the few privileged experts, and even the experts tend to hesitate before abandoning their own tiny part of the puzzle to compare notes with other so with others outside the specific subfield. Our aim in this book is to start putting some of the pieces of the puzzle together in full awareness that nobody yet has anything like like a complete test, like a complete set. The task is immense and the and the issue and the issue so so important that it that it will take years of research and debate even to begin to understand the real implications of the picture we're, set, we're starting to see. But it's crucial that we set the process in motion. One thing that will quickly be, one thing that will quickly be, become clearer, become clear is that the prevalent big picture of history set by modern day followers of Hobbes and Rousseau alike has almost nothing to do with the facts, but to begin making, but to begin making sense of the new information that's no, that's now before our eyes, it is not enough to compile and shift vast quantities of data. A conceptual shift is also required. To make that shift means retrac retracing some of the initial steps that lead to our modern solution of social evolution. The idea that human societies could be arranged according to stage of development, each with their own characteristic technologies and forms of organization, hunter-gatherers, hunter -gatherers, farmers, urban industrial society, and so, and, so, and so on. As we will see, such notions have their roots in a conservative backlash against critics of European civilization, which began to gain a ground in the early decades, decades of the 18th century. The origins of that critics, however, lie not with the philosophers of the Enlightenment, much thought, much thought they initially admired and imitated it, but with, indigen but with indigenous commentators and observers of Europe European society such as the Native American Huron Wendat, segments Candia Rock, of whom we will learn much more in the next chapter. Revisiting what we will call the indigenous critics, indigenous critic means taking seriously contributions to social thought that come 
from outside of the European canon, and in particular of those indigenous peoples whom Western philosophers tend to cast either in the role of historic angels, angels or its devils. God positions, God positions preclude any real possibility of intellectual exchange or even dialogue. It's just as hard to debate someone who is considered diabolical as someone considered divine as almost anything they think or say is likely to be deemed either, either irrelevant or deeply profound. Most of, this, most, most of the people we will be considering in this book are long since dead. It is no longer possible to have any sort of conversation with them. We are nonetheless determined to write prehistory as if as if it consisted of people one could one would have been able to, to, to been able to talk to when they were still alive who don't just exist as paragons, specimens, sub puppets, or playthings of some you know, inexorable law of history. There there are certainty certainly tendencies in history some are powerful currents so strong that they are very difficult to swim against though there are there are there are all there, are, there always seem to be some who manage to do it anyway but the only loss are those who make up are those we make up ourselves which brings us which brings us on to our second objection why both the Hobbesian and the Rossoian version of human history have their political implications? The political implications of the Hobbesian model need little elaboration. It is a foundational assumption of our economic system that humans are at best somewhat dusty and selfish creatures basing their decisions on cynical egoistic calculation rather than altruism or cooperation, in which case, the best we can hope for are more sophisticated internal and external controls on our supposedly innate drive towards accumulation and self aggrandizement Rousseau's story about how humankind descended into inequality from an original state of egalitarian innocence seems must Optimist, seem optimistic at, at least seems um, seems more optimistic at least there are somewhere better to fall from but nowadays it's mostly deployed to convince us that while the system we live under might be unjust the most we can realistically aim for is a bit of modest thinking the term inequality is itself very telling in its regard since the financial crash of 2009 and the upheals, upheals, uh, upheavals that follow, the question of inequality and with it the long-term history of inequality have become major topics for debate. Something of a consensus have emerged among intellectuals and even, to some degree, the political crisis that levels of social inequality have got have got out of hand and that most of the world's problems result in one way or another from an ever widening gulf between the haves the, the haves and the have not. Pointing this out is in itself a challenge to global power structures at same time at the same time, though it frames the issue in a way that people who benefit who benefit from those structures can still find ultimately reassuring since it implies no meaningful solution to the problem would ever be possible. After all, imagine we frame the problem indifferently, the way it might have been 50 or 100 years ago as the concentration of capital or oligopoly or class power. Compared to any of this, a word like inequality sounds like is practically designed to encourage half measures and compromise. It's possible to imagine overthrowing capitalism of weakening the power of the state 
but it's not clear what eliminating inequality would even mean. Which kind of inequality? What opportunity? Exactly how equal would people have to be in order for us to be able to say with the eliminated inequality? The term inequality is a way of framing social problem. Of ram is a way of framing social problems appropriate to an age of technocratic reformers who assume from the outset that no real vision of social transformation is even on the table. Debating inequality allows one to tinker with the, with the numbers, argue about Gini coefficients and thresholds of diet dysfunction, readjust re tax regimes or social welfare mechanisms, even sort the public with figures showing just how bad things have become. Can you imagine the richest one percent of the world population? The richest one percent or percent of the world's population on forty four percent of the world's health. But it also for but it also allows one to do all this without addressing any of the factors that people actually object to about such unequal social arrangements. For instance, that some manage to turn their wealth into power over over others or that other people end up being told their needs are not important and their lives have no intrinsic worth. The last we are supposed to believe is just inevitable effect of inequality and equality the, inev the, the inevitable result of living in large, in any large, complex, urban, technologically sophisticated society. Presumably, it will it will always be with us. It's just a matter of degree. Today, there is a veritable boom of thinking about inequality. Since 2011, global inequality has reg has re regularly featured as a top item for debate in the World Economic Forum at Davos. There, there are inequality indexes. Institutes for the study of inequality and a relentless stream of publications trying to project to current obsession with proper distribution back into the Stone Age. There have been even there have been there have even been attempts to calculate in, income levels and Gini coefficients for for Paleolithic mammoth hunters. They both turn out to be to be very low. It's almost as if we feel some need to come up with mathematical formulae justifying the expression already popular in the days of Rousseau that in such societies everyone was equal because they were all equally poor. The ultimate effect of all these stories about an original state of innocence and equality like the use of the term inequality itself is to make wishful pessimism about the human condition seem like common sense. The natural result of framing ourselves through history's broad lens. Yes, living in the truly egalitarian society might be possible if you are pygmy or Kalahari Basman. If you want to create a society of true equality today, you are going to have to figure out a way to go back to becoming teeny bands of voyagers again with no significant personal property. Since voyagers require a pretty extensive territory to forage in, this would mean having to reduce the, pop the, world the world's population by something like 99.9%. Otherwise, the best we can hope for is to adjust the size of the wood that, we for that will pro forever be stomping on our faces, or perhaps to wrangle a bit more wiggle, wiggle room in which some of us can temporarily duck out of its way. The first step towards a more accurate and hopeful picture of world's history might be to abandon the Garden of Eden once and for all and simply do away with the notion that, that for hundreds of thousands of years, if we were on earth set the same idyllic 
idyllic form of social organization. Strangely enough, though, this is often seen as a reactionary move. So, are you saying true equality has never been achieved, that, that it's therefore impossible? It seems to us that such objections are both counterproductive and frankly unrealistic. First of all, it's bizarre to imagine that, say, during the roughly 10,000, 10, some would like, some would say more like 2,000 years, in which people painted on the walls of Altamira, no one, not only in Altamira, but, any, but anywhere on earth, experimented with alternative forms of social organization. What's the chance of that? Second of all, is not the capacity to experiment with different forms of social organization itself a quintessential part of what makes of what makes us human? That is, beings with the capacity for self-creation, even freedom. The ultimate, the ultimate question of human history, as we'll see, is not our equal access to material resources, land, calories, means of production. Must do cease, must do these things as obviously important, but our equal capacity to contribute to decisions about how to live together. Of course, to exercise that capacity implies that there should be something meaningful to decide in the first place. If as many as if as many are suggesting our spacious future now hints how hints on our capacity to create something different, say a system in which what cannot be freely transformed into power or when some people are not told are not told their needs are, um, are important but that their lives have no intrinsic worth then what ultimately matters is whether we can dis we can rediscover the, the freedoms that make us human in the first place as long ago as 1938 1936 the prehistorian fee golden child wrote a book called man makes himself apart from the sexist language this is the spirit we wish to invoke we are projects of collective self-creation what if we approach human history that way what if we treat people from the beginning as imaginative intelligent playful creators who deserve to be understood as, as such what if instead of instead of telling a story about how our species fell from some idyllic state of equality we ask how we came to be strapped how we came to be trapped in such tight conceptual sectors that we can no longer even imagine the possibility of reinventing ourselves some brief examples of why received understandings of the broad sweep of human history are mostly wrong or the eternal return of James, Jaco James Jacques Rousseau. When we first embarked on this book, our intention was to seek new answers to questions about the origins of social inequality. It did not take long before we released this simply was not a very good approach framing human history in this way, which necessarily means assuming humanity once existed in an idyllic state and that a specific point can be, in, can be identified at which everything started to go wrong, made it almost impossible to ask, a, to ask any of the questions we felt very genuinely interesting. It felt like almost everyone else seemed to be caught in the same trap. Specialists were refusing to generalize. To generalize. Those few feel those few willing to stick their neck uh, necks out almost invariably reproduce some variation of on Rosso. Let's consider a fairly random example of one of these generalist accounts. Francis Fukuyama's The Origins of Polit The Origins of Political Order from pre-human times to the French Revolution 2011. 
here here is Fukuyama on what he feels can be taken as received wisdom about early human societies. In its early stage, human political organization is similar to the band level society observed in higher primates like chimpanzees, which Fukuyama uh, which Fukuyama suggests can be regarded as a default form of social organization. He then goes to he then goes on to assert that Rousseau was largely correct in pointing out that the origin of political inequality lay in the development of agriculture since hunter-gatherer societies, according to Fukuyama, have no concept of private property and solid incentive to mark out a piece of land and say, this is mine. Band level societies of this sort, he suggests, are hardly are high are highly egalitarian. Jared Diamond in the world uh, in the in the world until yesterday, what can we learn from traditional societies twenty twelve? Suggest that such bands in which he believes humans still live as recently as eleven thousand years ago compress just a few dozen individuals most bi biologically related these small these small groups led a very ma major existence hunting and gathering whatever wild animal and plant spe species happen to live in an array of forests and their and their social lives according to diamond were in were invariably simple decisions were reached to face-to-face -face discussion there were few personal possessions there were few personal possessions and no formal political leadership or strong economic specialization Di diamond concludes that sadly it is only within such primordial groupings that humans ever achieve a significant degree of social equality for Demon and Fukuyama, as for Rosso, some centuries earlier, what put an end to that equality everywhere and forever was the invention of agriculture and the higher population level it levels it sustained. Agriculture brought about a transition from bands to tribes, accumulation of food surplus, fed population growth leading some tribes to develop into ranked societies known as chiefdoms. Fukuyama paints an almost explicitly biblical picture on this process, a departure from, the, from Eden, a little band of human beings migrated and adapted to different environments. They began their exit out of the state of nature by developing new soci no social institutions. They fought, they fought wars over resources, Kingly and Parbesan, the, so the societies were clearly heading for trouble. It was time to go up and appoint some proper leadership. Hierarchies began to emerge. There was no point in resisting, since hierarchy, according to the Yaman and Fukuyama, is inevitable once humans adopt large, complex forms of organization. Even when the new Leaders began uh, began acting badly, creaming of agricultural surplus to promote their flunkies and relatives, making status permanent and heredity, collecting trophy, collecting trophy skulls and harems of self girls, or tearing out the or tearing out rivals' hearts with obsidian obsidian knives. There could be no going back. Before long, chiefs had managed to convince the other. Chief had managed to convince others they should be referred to as kings, even emperors, as the Yaman Petian Petiendi explains to us. Large populations can function without leaders who make the decisions, executives who carry out the, the executives who carry out the decisions, and bureaucrats who administer the decisions and laws. Alas for all of you readers who are anarchists and dream of living without any state of government with, without any state government those are 
the reasons why you why your dream is unrealistic you'll have to find some tiny band or try willing to accept you where no one is a stranger and where kings presidents and bureaucrats are unnecessary a dismal conclusion not just by anarchists but for anybody who ever wondered who if there might be a viable alternative to the current status quo still the truly remarkable things the truly remarkable thing is that despite the self assertion such pronouncements are not actually based on any kind of scientific evidence as we as we will soon be discovering there is simply no reason to believe that sm small scale groups are especially likely to be egalitarian or conversely that la that large ones must necessarily have kings presidents or even bureaucracies statements like this are just so many prejudice this prejudices dressed up as facts or even as laws of history on the pursuit of happiness as we say it's all just an endless repetition of a story first taught by Rousseau in 1754. Many contemporary scholars will quite literally say that Rousseau's vision has been, pro has been proved correct. If so, it is an extraordinary coincidence since Rousseau himself never, just, never suggested that the innocence of state of nature really happened. On the contrary, he insisted he was engaging in a thought experiment. One must not take the kit, the kinds of research with which we enter into as a the pursuit of truths and history, but solely as hypothetical and conditional reasonings, better fitted to clarify the nature of these of things than to expose their actual origin. Rousseau's portrayal of the state of nature and how it was overturned by the coming by the coming of agriculture was never intended to form the basis of a series of evolutionary stages like the ones Scottish philosophers such as Smith, Ferguson or Miller, and later on Lewis Henry Morgan were referring to when they spoke of savage savagery and barbarism in no sense what in no sense was also imagining this different state these different states of being as levels of social and moral development corresponding to historical changes in modes of production foraging pastoralism farming industry rather what also presented was more of a parable by way of an attempt to explore a fundamental paradox of human politics. How is it that our innate drive for freedom somehow leads us, time and again, on a spontaneous march to inequality? Describing how the invention of farming first leads to private property and property to the need for civil government to protect it. This is how Rosso put things, puts things or run towards the claims, the change, believing that they were they were securing their liberty. For although they had reason enough to discern the advantages of a civil order, they did not have experience enough to foresee the dangers. His imaginary state of nature was primarily in folk as a way of illustrating the point. True, he didn't invent the concept as a rhetorical device, the state of nature has already been used in European philosophy for a century. Widely deployed by, by natural law theories, it effectively allowed every thinker interested in the origins of government, Locke, Glocke, Grotius, and so on to pray God it's coming up with his own variant on this human on humanity's original condition as a springboard of for speculation. Hobbes was doing much the same thing when he wrote in Leviathan 
that the primordial state of human society would necessarily have been a bellum omnium contra omnes, a war of all against all, which could only be overcome by the creation of an absolute sovereign power. He was not saying there had actually been a time when everyone lived in such a primordial state. Some suspect that Hobbes' state of war was really an allegory for his native England's descent into civil war in the mid-17th century, which drove the royalist author into, ex into exile in Paris. Whatever the case, the closest, the closest Hobbes himself came to suggesting this state really existed was when he noted how the only people who weren't under the ultimate authority of some king were the king themselves and they always seemed to be at war with one another. Despite all this, many modern writers did Leviathan in the same way others did Rousseau's discourse, as if it were laying the groundwork for an evolutionary study of history, and although the two have completely different starting points, the result is rather similar. When it came to violent and priested peoples, writes the psychologist Steven Pinker, Hobbes and Rousseau were talking through their heads, neither knew a thing about life before civilization. On this point, Pinker is absolutely right. In the same breath, however, he also asks us to believe that Hobbes, writing in 1651, apparently through his head, somehow managed to guess right and come up with an analysis of violence and its cause and its cause in human history that is as good as any today this would be an astonishing not to mention not to mention damning verdict on centuries of empirical research if it only happened to be true as we'll see it is not even close we can take Pinker as our quintessential modern Hobbesian in his magnum opus, The Better Angels, The Better Angels for Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined, 2012, and subsequent books like Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress, 2018. He argues that today we live in a world which is Overall, far less viol violent and cool than anything our ancestors had ever experienced. Now, this may seem counter now, this may seem counterintuitive to anyone who spends much time watching the news, let alone who knows much about the history of the 20th century. Pinker, too, is confident that an objective statistical analysis, son of sentiment will show us to believe to, to be be, to be living in an age of, of unprecedented peace and security. And this he suggests is the logical outcome of living in sovereign states in, in sovereign states, each with a mon with a monopoly over the legitimate use of violence within its borders, as opposed to the anarchist societies as he calls them, of our deep evolutionary past where life for most, pe for most people was, indeed, typically nasty, brutish, and short. Since, like Hobbes, Pinker is concerned with the, origins, with the origins of the state, his key point of transition is not the rise of farming, but the emergence of cities. Archaeologists, he writes, tell us that humans live in a state of anarchy until the emergence of civilization some 5,000 years ago when sedentary farmers first coalesced into cities and states and developed the first governments. What follows is, to put it bluntly, a modern psychologist making it up as he goes along. You might hope that a passionate advocate of science would approach the topic scientifically through a broad appraisal of the evidence, but this is precisely the, the approach to human prehistory that Pinker seems 
to find and uninteresting. Instead, he released on anecdotes, imagines, and individual sensational discoveries like the headline make like the Helen making fine in nineteen in nineteen ninety one of Odyssey of the Triol Tyrolean as men. What it's what is it about the, anci the ancients? Pinker asks the point that they could not leave us an, an interesting corpse without resorting to folk play. There is an obvious re response to this. Does not doesn't it rather depend on which corpse will you consider interesting in the first place? Yes, a little over five thousand years ago, someone walking to the Alps left the world of the living with the with an arrow in his side. But there is no particular reason to the to the Aussie as a poster child for humanity in its original condition, other than perhaps Ozzy sitting Pinker's argument. But if all we're doing in a, is a cherry pink is cherry pinking, we could just as easily have chosen the much earlier burial noun to archaeologists of Asromito too, after the Calabrian rock shelter where it was found. Let's take a moment to consider what it would mean if we did this. Romito too is the ten years is the ten thousand year old burial of a male with a rare genetic disorder, a chromosomalic dysplasia, a severe type of dwarfis, dwarfism, which in life would have rendered him both anomalous in his community and unable to participate in the kind of high altitude hunting that was necessary for their survival. Studies, studies of his pathology show that, despite generally poor levels of health and nutrition, that same, commu that same community of hunter-gatherers still took pains to support this individual through infancy and into early adult that food, granting him the same share of meat as, a, as everyone else and ultimately according, in, according, according him a careful sorted burial. Neither is Gomito too an isolated case. When archaeologists undertake balance appraisals of huge gather burials from the Paleolithic, they find high frequencies of health-related disabilities, but also surprisingly high levels of care until the time of death and beyond, since some of these funerals were remarkably lavish. If we did, if we did want to reach a general conclusion about what form human societies originally took based on statistical frequencies of health indicators from ancient burials, we would have to reach the exact opposite conclusion to Hobbes and Pinker. In origin, it might be claimed our species is a nurturing and caregiving species and there was simply no need for, li for, li for life to be nasty, brutish, or short. We are not suggesting we actually do this. As we'll see, there is reason to believe that during the Paleolithic, only rather unusual individuals were buried at all. We just want to point out how easy it would be to play the same game in the other direction. Easy, but frankly, not too enlightening. As we get to grips with the actual evidence, we always find that they are the realistic of if we the reali they are the realities of if we human social life were far more complex and a good deal more interesting that any modern day state of nature theories would ever be likely to guess. When it comes to cherry picking anthropological case studies and putting them forward as representative of our contemporary ancestors, that is, as models for what humans might have been like in a state of nature, those, those working in the tradition of Rosso tend to prefer America tend to prefer Af African foragers like the Hadza, Pygmies, or Kung. 
those who fall those who follow hopes prefer the yao those who follow hopes prefer the yanomami the yanomami are an indigenous population who live largely by growing plantains and cassava in the amazon rainforest the traditional homeland on the border of south in as venezuela and northern brazil since 1970s, 1970s the yanomami have acquired a reputation as, uh, as the quintessential violent savage fierce people as the most famous ethnographer napoleon canyon called them this seems decidedly unfair to the yanomami since in fact statistics shows so they, they are not particularly violent compared with other Amerindian, Amerindian groups Yanomami homicide with rates turn out average to low again though actual statistics turn out to matter less than the availability of grammar images and anecdotes the real reason the Yanomami are so famous and have such a colorful reputation has everything to do with Canyon himself. His, 19, his 1968 book Yanomami, Fixed People, which sold millions of copies, and also a series of films such as The Axe, Hike, the, the Axe Fight, which offered viewers and a vivid glimpse of tribal warfare. For a while, all this made Kenyon the world's most famous anthropologist in the process turning the Yanomami into a notorious case study of primitive violence and establishing the scientific importance in the emerging field of sociobiology. We should be fair to Kenyon, but everyone is. She never claimed the Yanomami should be treated as living remnants of the Stone Age. Indeed, he often noted that they of use the word at the same time and somewhat unusually for an anthropologist, he tended to define them primarily in terms of things they lack. Example, written language, a police force, a formal judiciary, as opposed to the positive features of the culture, which has rather the same effect of setting them up as quintessential primitives. Canyon Canyon's central argument was that adult Yanomami men achieve both cultural and reproductive advantages by killing other adult men, and that this feedback between violence and biological fitness, if generally representative of the early human condition, might have had evolutionary consequences for our species as a whole. This is not just a big if, it is enormous. Other anthropologists started raining down questions, not always friendly. Allegations of professional misconduct were leveled at Canyon, mostly revolving around ethical standards in the field, and everyone took sides. Some of these accusations appear baseless, but the rhetoric of Canyon's, defend, Canyon's defenders grew so heated that as another celebrated anthropologist, Clifford Gates, put it, not only was, held, was he held up as the epitome of rigorous scientific anthropology, but all who, but all who questioned him or, or his social Darwinism were excoriated as Marxists, Marxists, liars, cultural anthropologists from the academic left, ayatollahs, and politically correct bleeding hearts. To this day, there is no easy way, there is no easier way to get anthropologists to begin denouncing each other as extremists than to mention the name of Napoleon Canyon. The important point here is that as the as a non-state people, the Yanomami are supposed to exemplify what thinkers call the hope, cause 
the Hobbesian step, whereby individuals in previous societies find themselves caught in repetitive, in, caught in repetitive cycles of wedding and warfare, living fraud and precarious living and precarious lives, always just a few steps away from violent death, violent death on the tip of a sub weapon or at the end of French school club. That Pinker tells us is the kind of dismal fate ordained for us by evolution. We have only escaped it by virtue of, of our willingness to place ourselves under the common protection of nation, nation states, courts of law and police forces, and also by embracing virtues of recent debate and self-control that Pinker sees as the exclusive heritage of a European civilizing process which produced the age of enlightenment, in other words, where in not for Voltaire and the police, the knife fight of a Kenyan's findings would have been physical, not just academic. There are many problems with his argument. We'll start with the most obvious. This idea that our current ideals of freedom, equality, and democracy are somehow products of the Western tradition would in fact have would in fact have come as an enormous surprise to someone like Voltaire. As we'll soon see, the Enlightenment thinkers who propounded such ideals almost such ideal uh, um, such ideals almost invariably put them in the mouth of foreigners, even savage like the Yanomami. This is hardly surprising since it's almost impossible to find a single author in that Western tradition from Plato to Marcus Aurelius to Erasmus, who did not make it clear that they would have been opposed to such ideas. The word democracy might have been invented in Europe barely since Greece at the time was much closer culturally to the to not to, uh, barely since Greece at the time was much closer culturally to North America and the Middle East than it was so than it was to say England. But it's almost impossible to find a single European or European author before the nineteenth century who suggested it would be anything uh, would be anything other than a terrible form of government. For obvious reasons, Hobbes position ten Hobbes position tends to be favored by those on the right of political spectrum and Rousseau's by those learning left. Pinker's positions Pinker positions himself as a rational centrist condemning what he considers to be to be the extremists on the either side. But why then they why then insist that all significant forms of human progress before the twentieth century can be attributed only to that one group of humans who used to refer to themselves as the white race and now generally call themselves by its more accepted synonym Western civilization. There is simply no reason to make this move. It would be just as easy, actually rather easier, to identify things that can be interpreted as the first string of rationalism, legality, deliberate, deliberative democracy, and so forth all over the world, and only then tell that, and only then tell the story of how they coalesce in into a, into the current global system. Insisting to the contrary that all good things come only from Europe and source one's work can be read as a retroactive apology for genocide since apparently for Pinker the enslavement, rape, mass murder and destruction of whole civilizations visited on the rest of the world by European powers by the European powers is just another example of humans comporting themselves as they always had. It is. It was in no sense unusual. What was really significant, so this argument goes, is that it 
is that it made possible the dissemination of what he takes to be purely European notions of freedom, equality before equality before the law and human rights to the survivors, whatever the unpleasantness of the past. Pinker assured us, there is every reason to be optimistic, indeed happy, about the overall path of our species has, t- has taken. True, he does concede there is there is scope for our for some serious tinkering in areas like poverty reduction, income inequality, or indeed peace and security, but on balance and relative to the number of people living on Earth and on Earth today. What we have now is a spectacular improvement of anything on our species accomplished in its story so far, unless you are black or live in Syria, for example. Modern life is, for Pinker, in almost every way superior to what came before, and here he does produce elaborate statistics which purport to show how every day in every way, health, security, education, comfort, and by almost any other conceivable parameter, everything is actually getting better and better. It's hard to argue with the numbers, but as any statisticians, but as any statistic, uh, statistician will tell you, statistics are only as good the premises on which they, be, they are based. Has Western civilization really made life better for everyone? This ultimately comes down to the question of how to preserve human happiness, which is a notoriously difficult thing to think to do. About the only dependable way any, anyone have, has ever discovered to determine whether one way of living is really more satisfying, fulfilling, happy, or otherwise preferable to any other is to allow people f- to full experience both, give them a choice, then watch what they actually do. For instance, if Pinker is correct, then any same person who had choose between a the violent chaos and ab- abject poverty of the tribal states in human development, b the relative security and prosperity of Western civilization won't hesitate to live for safety. But empirical data is available here and it suggests something is very wrong with Pinker con- with Pinker's conclusions. Over the last several centuries, there have been be- there have been numerous occasions when individuals found themselves in a position to make precisely this choice, and they almost never go to the way the way Pinker would have predicted. Some have left us clear, rational explanations for why they made the choice they did. Let us consider the case of Helena Valero, a Brazilian woman born into a family of Spanish descent, whom Pinker mentions as a white girl abducted by Yanomami in 1932 while traveling with her parents along the remote Rio de Miti. For two decades, Valero lived with a series of Yanomami families, marrying twice and eventually achieving a position of some, some importance in her community. Pinker briefly cites the account Valero later gave of her own life, where she describes the brutality of a Yanomami raid. What he neglects to mention is that in, 1950, in 1956, he abandoned, the, he, he abandoned the Yanomami to seek her natal family and live again in Western civilization only to find herself in the state of occasional hunger and constant dejection of, and loneliness. After a while, given the ability to make a fully informed, decis- informed decision, Helena Valero decided decided she preferred life among the Yanomami and returned to live with them. His, her story is, the, is by no means un, unusual. The colonial history of North and South America is full of accounts of settlers captured or adopted by indigenous societies 
being given the choice of where they wish to stay and almost invariably choosing to stay with the latter. This, this even applied to abducted, uh, abducted children. Confronted again with their biological parents, most would run back to their adoptive kin for protection. By contrast, Amerindians Indians incorporated in European society by the adoption of marriage, including those who, unlike the unfortunate Helena Valero, enjoyed the considerable wealth and schooling, almost invariably did just the opposite, either escaping at the earlier opportunity or having tried their best to adjust and ultimately failed, returning to indigenous society to live out their last days. Among the most eloquent commentaries on this whole on this whole phenomenon is to be found in the private letter written by Benjamin Franklin to a friend. When an Indian child has been brought up among us, taught our language and habituated to our customs, yet if he goes to see his relations and make one Indian rambles and make one Indian ramble with them, there is no persuading him to return, and that is not that is not natural merely as Indians, but as men is plainly from this that when that when white persons of either sex have been taken prisoner yeah, has been taken prisoner has been taken prisoner young by the indians and live a while, a while among them though ransomed by their friends and treated with all imaginable tenderness to prevail with them to stay among the english yet in a short time they become disgusted with our manner of life and the care and pains that are, te that are necessary to support it and take the first opportunity of escaping again into the woods from whence there is no reclaiming them. One instance I remember to have heard where the person was to be brought home to possess, to possess a good estate but finding some care necessary to keep it together, he relinquished it to a younger brother, reserving to himself nothing but a gun and match coat, with which he took his way again to the wilderness. Many who found themselves embroiled in such contests of civilization, if we may call them that, were able to offer clear reasons for their decisions to stay with their ex wife captors. Some emphasis the virtues of freedom they found in Native American societies, including sexual freedom, but also freedom from the expectation of constant toil in pursuit of land and wealth. Others not noted the Indians' reluctance either to let any more any one fall into a condition of poverty, hunger, or the destitution. It was not so much that they felt poverty and them poverty themselves, but rather that, but rather that they found life infinitely more pleasant in as in a society when no one else was in a position of abject misery. Perhaps much, perhaps much as Oscar Wilde declared. He was an advocate of socialism because he didn't like having to look at poor people or listen to the social stories. For anyone who has grown up in a city full of rough steepers and panhandlers, and that is unfortunately most of us, it's always a bit starting to discover there's nothing inevitable about any of this. Still others noted to the east, still others noted to east with which outsiders taken in by Indian families might achieve acceptance and prominent positions in their adoptive communities, becoming members of chiefly household or even chiefs themselves. Western propagandists speak endlessly about equality of opportunity 
this seem to have been societies where it actually exist existed by far the most common reasons however had to do with the intensity of social social bonds they experienced in native american communities qualities of mutual care love and above all happiness which they found impossible to replicate once back in european settings security takes many forms there is the security of knowing one has a statistically smaller chance to getting shot with an arrow and then there's the security of knowing that there are people in the world who will care deeply if one is how the conventional narrative of humans of human history is not quite wrong but quite needlessly dull one gets the sense that indigenous people that ingenious life was to put it very goodly just a lot more interesting than, than life in a western town or city especially in so far as the latter involved long hours of monotonous repetitive conceptually conceptually empty activity the fact that we find it hard to imagine how such an alternative life could be endlessly engaging and interesting is perhaps more a reflection on the limits of our imagination than on the life itself. One of the most pernicious aspects of standard world historical narratives is precisely that they dried everything up, reduce people to cardboard stereotypes, simplify the issues. Are we inherently selfish and violent? or innately kind and cooperative in ways that themselves undermine possibly then possibly even destroy our sense of human possibility noble surface are ultimately just as boring as surface ones more to the point neither actually exists helena valero was herself adamant on this point the yanomami were not the fields she insisted neither were the angels they were human like the rest of us now we should be clear here social theory always necessarily involves a bit of simplification for instance almost any human action might be said to have a political aspect an economic aspect a psychosexual aspect and so forth social theory is largely as is largely a game of make-believe in which we pretend just for the sake of argument that there's just one thing going on essentially we reduce everything to a cartoon so as to be able to detect patterns that would be otherwise invisible as a result all real progress in social science has been rooted in the courage to say things that are in the final analysis slightly ridiculous the work of Karl Marx, Simon Freud or Claude Lévi-Strauss being only particularly salient cases in point. One must simply the one must one must simplify the world to discover something new about it. The problem comes when long after the discovery has been made people continue to simplify. Hobbes and Rousseau told their contemporaries things that were starting profound and open the uh, profound and open new doors of the imagination now their ideas are just tight common sense there is nothing in them that justifies the continued simplification of human affairs if social scientists today continue to reduce past generations to to simply to simplistic two-dimensional caricatures it is not much it is not so much to show us anything original but just because they feel that's what social scientists are expected to do so as to appear scientific the actual result is to improve is to impoverish history and as a consequence to impoverish our sense of possibility let us end this introduction with an illustration before moving on the, to the heart of matter ever since adam smith 
to strengthen to prove the contemporary forms of competitive market exchange are rooted in human nature have have pointed to the existence of what they call primitive trade already tens of thousands of years ago one can find evidence of objects very often precious stones cells or other items items of adornment being moved around over enormous distances often this often this were just were just the sort of objects that anthropologists would later find being uses as primitive currencies all over the world surely this must prove capitalism capitalism in some form or another has always existed the logic is perfectly circular if precious objects were moving long distances this is evidence of threat and if threat occurred it must have taken some sort of commercial form therefore the fact that say three thousand years ago Baltic amber found its way to the Mediterranean or cells from the Gulf of Mexico were transported to Ohio is proof that we are in the presence of some embryonic form of market economy. Markets are universal. Therefore, there must have been a market. Therefore, markets are universal and so on. All such others are really saying is that the or such others are really saying is that they themselves cannot personally imagine any other way that precious objects might move about but lack of imagination is not is not itself an argument it's almost as if these writers are afraid to suggest anything that seems original or if they do feel obliged to use virtually scientific sounding language transregional interaction spheres multiscalar networks of exchange to avoid having to spectacular spec speculate about what precisely those things might be in fact anthropologists anthropology provides endless illustrations of how of how valuable objects might travel long distances in the absence of anything that remotely resembles a market economy the founding the, the founding text of 20th century ethnography Bronislav Malinowski's 1922 Argonauts of the Western Pacific describes how in the cooler chain of the massive island of the massive islands of Papua New Guinea mean men will undertake daring expeditions across dangerous seas in rigor canals just in order to exchange precious heirloom themselves themselves and necklace for each other each of the most important ones has its own has its own name and its story of former owners only to hold it briefly then pass it again and pass it on again to a different expedition from one another island. Heirloom treasures, heirloom treasures cycle the island chain eternally, crossing hundreds of miles of oceans, of ocean, arm cells and necklace in opposite directions. To an outsider, it seems senseless. To the men of the Masim, it was the ultimate adventure, and nothing could be more important than to spread one's name in this fashion to place one to places one had never seen. Is it trade? Is this trade? Perhaps, it, but it would be to breaking out our ordinary understandings of what that our, of what that what's what means. There is, in fact. A substantial ethnographic literature on how such long distance exchange operates in societies without markets. But there does occur. Different groups may take on specialties. One is famous for its further work, another for fast salt. In third, all women are potters. 
to acquire things they cannot produce themselves. Sometimes one group will specialize in the very business of moving people and things around. But we often find such regional networks developing largely from the sake of creating friendly mutual relations or having an excuse to visit one another from time to time. And there are plenty of art of other possibilities that in no way resemblance resemble trade. Let let's like let's list just a few or drawn from not American material to give the reader a taste of what might really be going on when people speak of long distance interaction spheres in the human past. One dreams of fission quest among Iroquia European speaking peoples in the 16th and 17th centuries, it was considered extremely important literally to realize one's dreams. Many, Euro many European observers marveled at how Indians would be willing to travel for days to bring back some object, trophy, crystal, or even an animal like a dog that they had dreamed of acquiring. Anyone who dream about a neighbor or relative's possession, a cattle, ornament, marks, and so on, could normally demand it. As a result, such objects will often gradually travel some way from town to town on the Great Plains. Decisions to travel long distance, long distances in search of rare, exo of rare ex or exotic items could form part of vision case. 2. Traveling healers and entertains. In 1528, when a, when a ship in tra two, traveling healers and entertains. In 1528, when a shipwreck spa Spaniard named Alvar Nunes Cabeza de, de, Va de Vaca made his way of made his way from from Florida across across what is now Texas to Mexico. He found he could pass easily between villages, even villages at war with one another, by offering his services as a magician and curer. Curers in much of curers in much of North America were also entertainers, and would often develop significant in in Those who felt their lives had been saved by the performance would typically over up all their material possessions to be divided among the troop. By such means, precious, precious objects could easily travel very long distances. 3. Women, gam women, women's gambling Women in many indigenous North American societies were inveterate gamblers. The women of adjacent villages would often meet to play dice or game played with a ball and plum stone and would typically bet their hell bits or other objects or personal adornment as the stakes. One archaeologist fact in the ethnographic literature Warren the Ball estimates that many of the cells and other exotic exotica discovered in such halfway across the continent had got there by being endlessly wagged wag wag and lost uh, inter in inter game in inter games games of this sort over very long periods of time. We could multi multiply examples, but assume that by now the reader gets the broader point we are making. When we simply guess as when we simply guess as to what humans in other times and places might might be up might be act up to, we almost invariably make guesses that are far less in inter that, that are far less interesting, far less quirky, quirky in a word, far less human than what was likely going on. On what's to follow, in this book. We will not only be presenting a new story of humankind, but inviting the reader 
into a new science of history, one that restores our ancestors to their full humanity. Rather than asking how we ended up unequal, we will start by asking how it was that how it was that inequality becomes such an issue to begin with, then gradually build up an alternative narrative that corresponds more closely to our current state of knowledge. If humans did not spend 65% of their evolutionary past in tiny bands of hunter-gatherers, what were they doing? What were they doing all that time? If agriculture and cities did not mean a plan into hierarchy and domination, then what did they imply? What was reality happening in those periods we usually see as marking the emergence of the state? The, answer, the answers are often unexpected and suggest that the course of human history may be less set in, in stone and more, full of, and more full of playful possibilities than we tend to assume. In one sense, then, this book is simply trying to lay down foundations for a new world history rather as Gordon Child did when, back into the 1930s, he invented crises like the Neolithic Revolution or the Urban Revolution. As such, it is necessarily uneven and incomplete. At the same time, this book is also something else, a quest to discover the right questions. If what is the origin of inequality? It's not the biggest question we should be asking about history. What then should it be? As, it, as the stories of one-time captives escaping back to the woods again make clear, Rosso was not entirely mistaken. Something has been lost. He just had a rather idiosyncratic and ultimately false notion of what it was. How do we characterize it then? And how lost is it really? What does it imply about possibilities for social change today? For about a decade now, we, that is, the two others of, the, of this book, have been engaged in a prolonged, prolonged conversation with each other about exactly these questions. This is the reason for the book's somewhat unusual structure which begins by tracing the historical roots of the question, what's the origin of social inequality, back to a series of encounters between European colonies and Native American intellectuals in the 17th century. The impact of those encounters upon what we now term the Enlightenment and indeed our basic conceptions of human history is both more subtle and profound than we usually care to admit revisiting them as we discover has starting implications for how we make sense the human past today, including the origins of farming, property, cities, democracy, slavery, and civilization itself. In the end, we decided to write a book that would echo, to some degree at least, the evolution in our own thought. In those conversations, the real breakthrough moment came when when we decided to move away from European thinkers like Rosso and Tagli and instead consider perspectives that they that derive from those ingenious thinkers who ultimately inspired them. So let us begin right there.